So good evening. It is evening. My name is Darren Grosser. Um, been in this industry, this uh, community here for just over 21 years now, and uh, had the fortunate, uh, you know, ability to run into somebody years ago, um, find a job that I loved, and you know, kind of the happily ever after is the, the saying. Um, find a job you like. I think everybody that's here at 7:30 on their own time probably likes your job a little bit. So. Uh, we appreciate user groups like this. So the main things that I'm proud of is, is you know, I do a lot with my colleagues and coworkers and things, but really my marriage and my two kids are the things that makes me the most proud. Now I'm a SolidWorks guy through and through, but when I'm at the office, I'm basically using the software based on customer need. When I'm home, I use it a lot more myself. So I did this project a couple of summers ago. It's a 12 foot by 12 foot tree house. It's 15 feet up in the air, and that doesn't sound like a lot unless you're standing 15 feet up in the air. But essentially, I use SOLIDWORKS for everything. So this was built using SOLIDWORKS weldments. Uh, weldments really is just a euphemism for um, structural members, essentially. It's the library of the profiles that you use. And I have a, a wood profile that gives me rough and finished sawn wood. So it gives you the same build characteristics, excuse me, the same weldment cut list, um, but for wood versus metal. But I use SOLIDWORKS for a lot of things like just simply vetting my ideas, getting them down on paper, showing my wife where the money's going, or just making sure that I've got room in areas like between that cabinet and that mirror so that when I try to shove a light in between there, it works. And when you have a good plan, you just have to execute the plan. And that's really what we're all about when it comes to SOLIDWORKS. So I spend a lot of time with my 3D printer building parts, um, inventing parts, replacing parts that break, even though they're cheap to buy, sometimes it's more fun to design them and print them. It's not whether you should, it's whether you can in some cases. So that's what I do a lot of. Now recently I tore apart a trolling motor and decided to take the switch on the inside, design myself up a nice little throttle housing and print that thing up and now that's what's on my pontoon boat. So I actually have a paddle wheel pontoon boat on a no wake lake. It's a big boat, you sit there and pedal it, but in windy days it's not so fun. So I had to adapt it to throw that trolling motor up. So I spend a lot more time in SOLIDWORKS, stick time practicing and stuff on my own personal time. For here though, it's more of your benefit. And since you're here for model-based definition, I'm really curious as to where you are in the model-based definition journey, so to speak. Um, do any of you currently use model-based definition of any kind? Not a single hand. That's awesome. We're, a little we're bit. looking to go in that direction soon. Okay. So this will be good, good relevance. Have any of you gotten data from somebody that has model-based definition built into it? Or even aware of it? Because you might be getting data that way and by either not being able to import the PMI or the, the model-based definition elements or not knowing it's there, you wouldn't know to open it. So this could be quite eye-opening for all of you. Um, have any of you ever dabbled with the DIM expert? A little bit there. Uh, could I ask for what purpose? Just to see what it could do or? Yeah, if it was gonna help me maybe see like drawings and stuff. Okay, gotcha, all right. So this will be quite informative for all of you. Now we are recording this, so take some notes on the things that you find important so you can go back into the video and watch this. Um, but for any of you that want more detail, if you wanna come up afterwards and just grab a business card from me, you can throw questions right at me about what we showed. Uh, the main thing that we're talking about though is communication when it comes right down to it. Uh, one of my favorite little pictures that you'll see is, this is how the customer explained it. And that's how somebody understood it. And you know, that's how the engineer designed it. Everybody in the line had some other idea of what this conversation meant in their head. And that's the biggest problem. I love when you get down into these, how the customer was billed, that's awesome. You know, and then how the help desk supported it, geez, that's really bad. But we really just wanna get the right information across. Now, what we typically do today, and we'll just talk 2017, 2018 range. Um, I'm looking for my water and I'm not seeing it, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, it's back there, let me walk back there while we talk about it. So we've got these nice 3D CAD tools. We haven't always had these CAD tools. Um, we have had, since the beginning of time, the ability to draw 2D, whether it's the stone and chisel, or the manual drafting board, or AutoCAD, if you want to call that um, CAD. It's really more of an electronic pencil. But now we have these 3D products. And what we do today is sort of a little bit of the new and a little bit of the old. We make a beautiful 3D part. Take that 3D part, put it into an assembly. We do that so we can test assembly interferences, uh, maybe mass properties, movements, those types of things. Then we go back to old standby. We make a 2D drawing. And then we take that 2D drawing and hand it to somebody, hoping that they will manually make the G-code that then reproduces that accurate 3D part we started with. And then if you even go to the next step, we talked about this earlier, 
if you have to inspect the goods that you're actually producing and then kick those pieces of information back onto the design intent to vet whether it got manufactured properly, that's another manual step in this entire process. So basically what we're talking about is taking a beautiful 3D part and flattening it, hoping somebody will interpret that 2D product or that 2D drawing appropriately to make the 3D part we started with. We are trying to get rid of these two areas. Now, this is pretty much the same process that it was when we were told to go metric back in like, what, 83? Something like that, who's metric? We've got a couple of you, all right. This is a very slow moving ship and we're gonna have drawings for forever. But for those of you who want to start biting this off, there are companies that are ahead of the game, there are companies that are dabbling. Um, it's out there and it's going to get more and more prevalent. So we'll talk about this as we go. So what we're trying to do, and we've started with the last few releases of SolidWorks, um, is taking all these little tools that we have, all these different silos of functionality, and they all now talk to each other. So what we're doing is we're actually taking the model now and making it the center of the universe for everything. And it felt like it was that way already. It felt like you made your part and the drawing was based on the part and if the part changed, the drawing changed and vice versa. And then the assembly is also being based on the part. So it all feels like our part is the central part of our universe anyways. But we're really talking about getting the drawing out of that process. Taking the part, putting the MBD or the PMI, um, product manufacturing information directly on the part, and then using that to go directly into things like a 2D drawing, still the tried and true, and I'll show you how to do that or go right into CNC that's based on the numbers and the tolerances that are actually in this model-based definition scheme. And then the inspection, also based on the 3D PMI elements of the 3D part. So we're eliminating the time-consuming part of making a 2D drawing and then the ambiguity that comes along with it. Now, the reason we're doing this kind of thing is because of tools like model-based definition uh, being available to us. And I'll show you kind of the historical process of where we went with this. The way we live today, though, is we're still going to need drawings for the time being. So I want to cover both of these different areas. Now, there's a little bit of an offshoot to this as well, and that is the downstream process of actually CAM, the machining of the part, and then the inspection process that I was talking about before, where we actually laser scan, coordinate measuring machine, depth gauge a part, and then feed the results of the actual manufactured part back onto what our drawing actually depicted, making sure that we're manufacturing properly. We're going to stick with these top two for right now, um, but I'll mention the other ones at the end just so you understand exactly where they fit into the entire mix. So starting with model-based definition, this is essentially what it is. So we've got this part. That's what we're going to machine. Now the process we typically take on something like this is we'll make that part in SolidWorks. Again, take the part and you know, machine it in its different orders. But all of this processing is still based on that 2D drawing something that has to be built, and then a potential um, data problem if there is an error with file management or you break the associativity to your SOLIDWORKS part. It's just another file to deal with. We're trying to get rid of this piece of it and put it all right there on the 3D part file. So again, it just eliminates that extra step. So with all of this, there's a big push coming from a few different areas. Um, Tesla, we are seeing a ton of information in uh, model-based definition, SpaceX, kind of the same thing. And then the DOD was actually the biggest proponent of this starting about 10 years ago. So the DOD loves this model-based definition. And really the main reason is, is they did a study. And they found out that they spend about 60% of their time doing 2D drawings, and that half of those drawings don't even match the actual part file they depict. And that's ridiculous, because even with products like SolidWorks, where associativity works, they were still getting this disjointed drawing not matching the part. You know, and bad data management practices can have that happen. What they also found out was they did a study between this nice armored personnel carrier and the documentation for the armored personnel carrier to see which was heavier. <laughs> exactly. The documentation was a full 2,000 pounds heavier than the actual armored personnel vehicle. For each one of these they ship, there is a semi driving behind it with the paperwork in the back. That crap doesn't get looked at, but it is a necessary thing to do. So these are the things that we need to get rid of, is that kind of stuff. Um, it's just bloat in the process. So they figured that out. So what we're doing with model-based definition is taking that part and then scheming it like you do in a 2D drawing. So there's really not that big of a leap. And then being able to communicate directly with that 3D part. So it has to do with auto-dimensioning, which I'll show you a few different ways to do that. Um, importing the PMI, we are now dealing with our competitor's files. So earlier I showed inspection in here. 
One of the things we can do today with Solix 2018 is I can read a pro e-file, Creo, depending on how long you've been in the business, with PMI on it into my inspection tool and actually inspect with their PMI data. So I'm reading non-native SOLIDWORKS files with PMI and I'm doing SOLIDWORKS functionality with it, which is fantastic. So we're dealing with competitors' files as well as our own. The STEP AP242 we're going to talk about quite a bit because STEP is a neutral file type, but that's the black box of choice, is the neutral STEP file with PMI attached to it. And that's now capable with the STEP standard called AP242. Up till now, it's been AP203 and 214, which are all geometry. 242 includes annotations. It's fantastic stuff. You'll see how that goes. So we're making deliverables, which is either the form of e-drawings, if you're already tried and true with those, or PDFs, which are a universal standard when it comes to just any type of documentation. So that's a great way to deploy it in a black box format. The PDFs go out as a rotate and viewable option with a built-in, on your choice, AP242 body for somebody to machine with. So that's the ultimate um, deliverable for what we're trying to do. So there's that step AP242 part of this. Now I find that it is very important to understand the DIM expert in order to make model-based definition work for you, because really this is what it's all about. Now the DIM expert is the way we annotate things. And I want to show you how this actually works. Um, I forgot what my next slide was. Okay. The DIM expert is an important thing because model-based definition is not in any of your licenses unless you've purchased it. So I'm just going to be flat out with that. It's a bolt-on, just like inspection is a bolt-on. But you can put it on solid standard seat. You don't need professional or premium for that. But DIM expert has been in every seat of SOLIDWORKS for at least 10 years, going on more like 15. There's a little tab that's there. It's got dimensional tools on it. Well, those are the dimensional tools that are actually the functionality that we use for model-based definition. The difference is being able to export the file types necessary to communicate, and that's where the MBD portion of the software comes in. But the DIM expert is something you can dabble in today, whether you own model-based definition or not. So I want to show you what this looks like because it's the way you set things up, and then really where the, uh, the functionality moves forward when it comes to the um, deliverables and communication um, things for that. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Excuse me. So what I want to do is show you a little bit about how we scheme these parts. And I'm going to use a, a fairly old data set that I've been showing, but I've kind of tidied it up and, and freshened it for this particular operation. So we're sitting inside of SOLIDWORKS right now. And when you're looking at stuff inside of SOLIDWORKS, we've added a tab recently to the interface down here at the bottom that's called 3D Views. Now most of you in the back can't see that, so I'm going to be doing some things here and there where I'm actually going to be zooming in on the interface here. And I'm not great at it yet, but this will let you see what we're talking about in the back a little bit more. Um, this is basic Windows functionality, so if you want to know how to do this, I'll show you afterwards. We have a tab that we added down here called 3D Views. Now 3D Views have to do with capturing this model-based definition that we're talking about. So as I zoom in and out of the interface, what you're basically seeing over here, and I'll get my magnifier a little out of the way, are snapshots of different orientations. And these are how we capture um, the different views which are essentially the parallel to your front, top, right, and other views on a 2D drawing. So think of everything that you see down there as what a 2D drawing gives you. Now these views can capture a lot of different things. When I select them and double click them, you see I've got a section view that's active. We can have feature suppression, sketches shown or hidden, sheet metal parts and flat or fold situations even explode view information that can be depicted in all of these views. The views themselves are just a snapshot of what you see at that particular time. So you'll see how this plays out. The main part about scheming a part, though, is, um, is datums. How it's actually referenced, how it gets assembled. And the reference I'm giving you right here is very simply that this part gets bolted to this bottom plate, and then there's some other very critical pieces of geometry that we have to deal with inside of this document. So when you know what your primary, secondary, and tertiary datums are, that helps you scheme parts. Now I need to admit that my gd &T skills are incredibly lacking. Anybody else pretty much the same way? It's amazing. I mean, I knew it once upon a time and I recognized things, but I really am not very good with this. So uh, interestingly enough, that's going to be a necessary skill for some of us to actually make this fly moving forward. So, but with that, the software does an awful lot of this on its own for you. So I'm looking at this little part right here. Now I've got a couple of 3D views that have already started on the bottom. 
Um, double clicking those once again will put you into whatever that position is. And again, it's a snapshot of what's hidden and shown and, and where things are at any particular time. So each of these is going to be um, quite a unique little thing here. So what I want to do on this one is the first little piece, which to be able to communicate like you would on a 2D drawing, you need to be able to put notes and other things like that. Well, we added something called a notes area a few releases back. And what that is is effectively a 2D plane that you drop things on that doesn't rotate. Now, I'm going to use my design library here because I have an annotation. It's just a note that I've saved over there that I can add to this face just by simply dragging and dropping that into the graphics area. Now, when I go ahead and do that, excuse me, that's the one that I want. Um, when I go ahead and do that, what I get is this little note that shows up. Now, you'll notice that I can reposition that note and put it wherever I'd like, but it stays on a flat plane. So as I start to rotate my part around, you see that that note is fully visible. But the note itself is just like any other note. You see I have properties like weight. Um, again, I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit. There's weight, there's a drawn by up there. And of course, like any other note, if I want to go ahead and do this, what I can do is simply select in the note and then using basic inputs over here in the note tool, which would be things like the property manager, you can insert custom properties to the note. So if I wanted something, for example, like the material here, we're just putting in the actual material based on what's in the feature manager, property, material, and that gets an associative value. But what that gives you is a title block type element here in the 3D file, just like you'd see in a 2D document. The all dims will show this in a little bit. That's gonna have a little bit more to it when it comes to everything that happens to be visible. But the main thing that we're trying to do here is dimension the part. And the reason we're doing this is because when you make a part using a parametric tool, think of each feature as you build them as a subset related to what exists before it. And we dimension them for parametric control. We're not dimensioning them for manufacturing for the most part. Later features in a part, you're just putting holes on, you might dimension those for physical manufacturing. But all the other things that we do on a part are based on how we want that part to predictably change when dimensions change. In other words, what I'm saying is that when we make 2D drawings, although SOLIDWORKS has the ability to bring in your sketch and feature dimensions and populate your drawing, how many of you actually do that? A couple of you do. Now, you do that probably because you're building the part in such a way that you know you're setting yourself up for success when it comes to dimensioning. Sort of accurate there? If you're not, then you're basically putting the part on a drawing and you're re-dimensioning the entire thing from scratch. Why not just use model-based definition if you're going to do that? We're already doing it anyways. So again, eliminate the 2D drawing and work from here. So I want to show you how this product actually functions. Now up here at the top, let me zoom in one more time. You see I've got two tabs. The Dim Expert, which is a tab that we always have in the software, and then the one next to it, which is my Model Based Definition tab. And if I zoom out slightly here, you'll see that we have all these different ways to put in dimensions, um, size dimensions, locations, basic, this auto scheme. And then when I go to my MBD tab, it's all those same buttons plus datums and surface finish marks, and then ways to export a PDF, an e-drawing, a step file, and so on. So these are the things. The actual deliverables is really what the model-based definition tool adds in to what you already have. Up to that point, though, you can dimension and scheme your part all you want using a standard seed of SOLIDWORKS. So the way this functions initially is I'm going to start with an auto-dimension scheme. Now what you have to do is answer a few questions here. Uh, I'm going to make this part prismatic clearly. I'm going to use geometric tolerancing on this one. And now we're just picking datums. So more or less how I showed you in the assembly, it was bolted to a plate and it had a few other key features. So over here on the side, we're picking things graphically. We'll just select the bottom face here. That's my primary datum. Secondary datum in this case is going to be this main hole. There's a big gear that goes through there. And this is a bracket. Um, these are the real parts up here. This is a bracket for some focusing rings for an underwater camera housing. So that's why all these little gears go together. The second, um, uh, sorry, the third datum is actually going to be one of the holes uh, that actually takes one of the gear sets through it. Again, the key is understanding how the DIM expert works. Looking forward, the deliverable has some interactivity where people select the dimensions and they highlight features and faces. It's a very discoverable and pleasant thing. Well, you're essentially setting that up by the way you dimension this. So if I want my tertiary datum to actually be this hole, when I click it, we have this button that pops up. It's right here. And it basically gives you a bunch of different choices. Now what it did is if you see, there's actually four holes here that are physically highlighted. And what it believes with those four holes is that we found a pattern automatically. And that's not how I want this dealt with. But what I do have is a hole that goes through two different faces. So I want that to actually be a compound hole. It's a hole that's gonna highlight, but it's gonna highlight two different physical cylindrical faces um, based on one element that I'm talking about. So understanding how these selection tools allow you to pick a face and determine it as a cylinder, a round face, a pattern, or a compound hole broaching multiple faces 
is really the key to being able to understand how this tool works. Now, once I've got those put in place, what I'm then going to do is go ahead and select discreetly some of the features that I want to dimension. Now, in my case here, what I'm going to dimension are those two holes that we use down here for the fasteners. And by clicking one of those, it picks up that they're the same size, so it finds them as a pattern. It's just one of the behaviors that it has. And then for the second hole, it's going to be this main hole right back here. Now, once I've got each of those in place, I hit the magic go button, and it does all the heavy lifting for you. Now, it'll put scheming on the part. It will go ahead and actually highlight those holes as green. Now, there's a button here that actually shows you. It's a visible thing that tells you the status of your tolerances. Is it overdefined, underdefined, or fully defined? And in this case, green is what we want. I can turn that overlay off at any time. As I start to add additional dimensions, the part will continue to get more, more and more green. And you don't need a full green part. These profiles around this outside edge, those don't mean anything when it comes to the final function of my part, at least in this part it doesn't. But the locations of the holes and all the internal machining is very critical. So you want to really scheme the things that are important and then the rest of it just gets some nominal values when it comes to machining. Okay, all that being said, when we're putting these types of schemes on there, it's going to auto dimension based on what we selected. But the main thing is understanding how that dim expert functions over here in, in the, uh, the tree. Now the way that it shows up by default is that it gives you just this basic feature by feature selection. And I really prefer to right click at the top of this and change it to be an annotation based tree where it essentially gives you the datum faces and then it shows different faces and positions and other things that it found based on the datums I selected and then the features that I want to be dimensioned. Now all that being said, when we're actually dealing with this, excuse me, I told you I'm not so good at that, so I'm zooming in and out on you. But all that being said, what we need to understand is under this annotations folder is all these different standard views. Now we're capturing views down here at the bottom, but these are all basic standard views when it comes to orientations uh, associated with basically with a top, I'm sorry, with a, uh, um, a basic 2D drawing. Right now I'm on the front view, and anything that I do goes into the front orientation. So I'm going to move over now to the top view for a second. And you do that by right clicking on any one of these views. And you can either activate it, which means when it's activated, annotations I'm adding are automatically put in that plane. Or I can do both activate and reorient, which will then activate it, but also give me this top view. Now right now the top view has just this single feature here, which was the holes that we used um, for the auto dimensioning scheme. And there's more to what we need here. Now I can either start picking on entities and dimensioning like I would on a 2D drawing, or I can right click on some of these positional features. We pick these holes, it dimension them based on the datums, and I can actually right click and automatically create basic dimensions just by that right click operation. So it'll show based on the datum holes exactly where those basic dimensions happen to be. Now interestingly on this one, it doesn't always work perfectly, which is really the way software is, but we have the flexibility for you to control everything. And when I rotate out of this plan view, one of the things you're going to notice, I'm going to get rid of that note, I dropped it in twice, is there's a couple of dimensions, this three and this four, that actually have to do with those holes, but they're not in the right orientation. When you have those types of things happen, you can actually just select those dimensions, I'm control picking them, and by right clicking them, you can change the actual annotation view that they're sitting on. So in my case, this one says annotation view back, we're actually going to change that to the top view, the view that we were just in. So now if we go back and look at that top view, you'll see that those annotations are now sitting in that position just like they would on a basic 2D drawing. So we'll throw a couple of those in place. That looks pretty good. Now that being the case, this is my top view. I'm just going to go ahead and simply capture my 3D view. Now you can choose the orientation that we have visible here, but we can also choose um, any of the annotations that we actually want to be in that. Now in my case, it's auto-selected every single annotation view that's available to it. And I really, really want the annotations that are in the top view, so I'm just deselecting and only using the ones that are attached to that top plane. Okay, we say okay to that, and it will add the top view down here to the bottom. So at any point, I can switch over to, say, back to my overview that we had over here, and then at any point, I can go back to my top view, and you'll see it just like a 2D drawing. That's why 2D drawings aren't necessary. I know we project them in a particular way, and we do that so that we can line things up on a drafting board, and all those practices have moved forward. But in reality, we're looking for top orientation and the dimensions that are important there, so that's why we're doing it this way. Now, we're going to go to the back to the front view here for a second. So I'm going to right-click on this one and activate and orient, moves me to that position, and then shows me the dimensions that are already in that particular view. Now, for this one here, I've got a hole that's right here in the center. Uh, it's actually this one over here, it's position four. So same thing, I'm just gonna right click on that one and create a basic dimension, which will throw in the value there, 
based on the datum, which is that bottom face. So in many ways, a lot of what we do here is completely automatic. It's just like a 2D drawing, the fact that I can select a dimension, I can click on the arrows, and I can change those arrows to being inside instead of outside. Sizes of those are a little bit off, but not too bad. So similar to the dimensional cleanup that you'll do on a basic 2D drawing. Now on this particular one, let's go ahead and just capture this 3D view for a second here. Um, in my particular case, I'm gonna go ahead and just use the dimensions that are in the front view. And if you give me one second, I got a behavior happening here that my property manager is not auto showing. That got turned off. Hmm. You may have seen that before. Okay, so my front view is activated and I oriented it. But the main thing is that it's active, which means I can actually work in odd orientations if I want to, dimension based on faces that I want to be able to pick, and every single dimension that I'm adding is going to be added to that front plan view. I'll show you what I mean right here. So I'm going to do one more auto dimensioning scheme. There's a button up at the top, there's a button down here at the bottom. But the main thing is that I want to capture this whole pattern that we have on this front face. So I'm going to change this to a plus minus scheming, and then those are polar, obviously not linear. So I just want to be sure that that's set properly. Other than that, my primary datum is this middle hole in the center. And when you pick one of the features, it automatically figures out that because they're the same size and they're oriented at equal spacing, that it just captures the entire pattern that's there. So all we have to do is grab those entities. That does it for us once again, we say okay, and it throws in a bunch of things. Now I go back to my front view and you see the dimensions that I just added are in that front view. I just conveniently went to an isometric view to add them because it's easier to pick faces that way. But in this case, now I'm in my plan view so I can do a little bit more tidying up and put some of these dimensions and annotations in a place that maybe it just looks a little better like a 2D drawing. Um, but in any event, now there's too much here. There's just too much here. I've added those new drawing dimensions for that polar array, and uh, I just don't like the way it looks. So one of the things that we can do with this is actually add in a new view. So by right-clicking on the annotations folder, there's an option there that simply says insert annotation view. Now, it doesn't have to be a completely unique view. I'm actually going to put one in that's parallel to the front plane, the way we're looking right now. But I want to separate some of those holes from the other, just for clarity's sake. So we're gonna put it in the front view, but when you click next, the choice says, what annotations do you want to move to that front view? And I'm gonna choose the pattern ones that we just did. So the quantity, the array, uh, I think that one's the bolt hole circle. So we'll pick those three. And when I say okay to that, what it does for me now is it gives me the opportunity to capture a new view called front one. And what you'll see here is that front one, only containing the front one annotations that I've now moved into that new annotation view, now give me a front and a front one next to each other that are identical, except they show different dimensions. Uh, not identical, it slid down a little bit, but I can get past that. So I'm showing a similar orientation, but I'm clearing it up by just simply isolating a couple of different layers of dimensions, okay? So easy enough for something like that. Now, on top of all of what we're doing right there, there's some things that get just a little bit more complex. And those don't really work a lot for the automated types of operations. So I want to go ahead and change over to this right view here. We're going to activate and orient over to this position. And again, for my sake, picking faces is easier. And it highlights faces in the output document. So my right view is activated. I'm going to move outside that orientation. And we're going to start to just add some dimensions. So the dimensions that we like to add on something like this, particularly are either location dimensions um, which could be either size or location, those are going to have tolerances, or there are basic dimensions, which are untoleranced and they have the box around it. So that's really the two that you can choose. So what I'm going to do on this one is choose a location dimension. Now the picks walk you through some of this process, and what I mean by that is I'm going to do a dimension between this face on the outside and the face on the inside. What happens, however, is when you pick a face like this, because the face is separated by cuts, we don't have the entire face that we would really want to represent with this type of selection. So that's where the selection tool comes back into play. What we get here initially is an initial face or a planar face, but there's this button over here called create a compound plane. And what that allows you to do is select multiple faces to be represented by the single input. That way when you click the dimension to highlight, it's gonna give you that face and that face so that you know that they are one and the same. So we say okay to this, and then that just basically groups those two faces. Now I can roll this around a little bit, select the back face, and I've got a nice little dimension there. Now the dimensions come in with tolerances. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but these are all subject to change. So make no mistake, it's just like the same property manager you use for every other dimension you've ever created. 
You can change the dimension in this case to a limit if you want. That's gonna go ahead and give you a plus or minus that's a lot better um, than we had before in this case. Uh, I apologize, the fonts are a little small for the group in the back there, so I hope you're seeing that. Uh, but in any event, we've now changed that dimension. Well, now I can continue to just add dimensions. And because these faces were grouped, I can pick this front face. You see how I picked it once and the whole thing highlighted that time? Now it's smart enough to understand that that is a grouped set of faces. Now that being the case, I'm gonna dimension from that face to the inside here, because those are pretty critical. Um, let's just drop that in place. Uh, I got another dimension here from top face to bottom face. So easy enough. Remember though, the entire time I'm doing this, and then we'll do from the bottom face, maybe the uh, thickness in the bottom. The entire time I'm doing this, all the dimensions that we're actually capturing are oriented from that right side view. So if we just orient to that view, you're gonna see each of those dimensions that I'm placing in there is being put in that orientation. Now at any point I can capture this view, and that's great. We're just gonna capture it and make sure that we've got it safe and sound, but I'm still activated and I'm still adding dimensions to that as I work. Now one of the dimensions that's kind of interesting on this one, there's actually a couple that are quite cool, but I'm gonna put a dimension that's going on an angled face. Now there are nuances to the way you add dimensions. There are obviously clear things. You pick a cylinder, you pick a face, you pick an edge. Those kinds of things are simple. But angled faces, faces with draft or taper, um, especially in a case like this where we have fillets, I might want to dimension this face, but that face terminates at a fillet at the top and a fillet at the bottom. So I can't pick the actual face. I can only pick the patch that we have based on the feature history. But when you're putting in dimensions again, like this location dimension, what I have is a nice opportunity here to select the virtual intersections of those. So here I'm gonna pick a face, but when this box pops up, I've got my regular plane, I've got my compound plane, which I've already shown you, but then there's this button right here that's called intersection line, which is essentially that virtual intersection between two faces. Now what that does is it gives you that combo input box, and when I select two faces, it'll give you right between those exactly where that axis is. So I can do that twice. I can pick a face at the top, Say I want to do a virtual intersection between that face and another one. And when I say OK to that, what I've now got is a dimension that goes right between those two virtual intersections. So it's a pretty cool way to be able to do that. And again, going back to the front view, you'll see that that dimension gets added. Now the dimension has a lot of orientation to it. You see these buttons over here on the side, it's like a 3D sketcher tool. What you're seeing there is X direction, Z, or sorry, Y direction, Z direction, um, normal to or parallel to a user defined edge. Those kinds of things are all available. So as I select this, I can make it a Y dimension, which is vertical, a Z dimension, which is horizontal, or what it was there, which is essentially true length dimension of that face. Um, this last one here allows you to pick an edge, so if I wanted to make it parallel to a different edge, it would make it arbitrarily based on some selection. So just another way to do that. But there are many, many ways to get the input in place, uh, regardless of the type of geometry that we're trying to depict. I'm gonna do a little more of this, but any questions at that point? The actual angle, uh, that's just between those two faces. So basically what you're getting here is just a regular location dimension. Uh, this might be a basic dimension, but we'll grab those two faces and that just throws the angle in. So it's the intuitiveness that you should just try it. Because um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't put an angle on there, but I just figured I'd try it and run with it. I got lucky. So just run with it and it usually is gonna work like it does in the other areas of the software. Um, code writers are very big about consistency. So if we dimension one way in one place and a different way in another, that just doesn't fly internally. So we want it to be um, as identical as possible. Yeah? You know, I know you said you were going to get to about the power axis. Um, I was really curious about that. What drives that? Mm -hmm. Something you set up beforehand? Or? Right on. So yeah, I'll be there in just one minute here. Let's get over to the left view for a second. Um, I want to bop out of this for a minute. We're going to activate and orienta orientate. Ooh, that's a bad one. We're going to activate and orient um, this left side. So with this one here, what I wanna do is a couple of different dimensions. Now, we're gonna add some dimensions to this particular feature, but I want you to look at the geometry for starters. Um, I'm gonna do this, but I wanna do it at two different levels. We've got a second level here, and then we've got this first level feature out in the front. So starting with my left view, we're gonna deal with a few of the features um, that are right here on this front face. Now, I mentioned to you that sketch and feature dimensions are more or less eliminated from this process. That's actually not true there may be a few sketch or feature dimensions that are critical dimensions. Uh, if I look at a 3D part and I see two or three dimensions that have tolerances added to the part, those are probably real dimensions because they've got tolerances added. Other than that, the rest are there for fully defining a sketch in some cases. Well, you can actually pull those in and use them. 
Now we do that by going over to the Annotations tab. And again, this is something that's fairly critical to understand. Is I'm going to right click on Annotations tab and I'm going to say, first of all, Show Feature Dimensions. Now what that does is it activates Sketch and Feature Dimensions. But what I also have to do is right click and show the unassigned elements. And what that does now is it messes up my graphics because, and I'll do this live now, not zoomed, show feature dimensions off or show feature dimensions on. So you can bring those dimensions in temporarily. Now, that being said, what I would end up doing is I would go ahead and take a few of these dimensions and I would move them into this view. So what I want to do first is I want to um, get out of a different order here. Let's hide these dimensions one second. I want to capture this left side view because I want everything that I do to be active in this left side view and I want to name it preemptively and I'll show you why. Because we can take any of these unassigned dimensions, sketch and feature dimensions, and just by simply selecting them. So I'm going to control pick tolerance dimensions, again real, um, basic tolerances, okay, those are real. And then I'm going to right click on those and I'm going to simply change the annotation view. And in this case, I had to have the left one there in order to select the left, which is why I pre-created it. Now by picking that, what it will then do is take those feature and sketch dimensions and make them part of that view. So if I now right click and my hide my unassigned, and I right click and I, no, I don't have to do anymore. Those are the ones that I actually grabbed. In fact, this is the one that I don't need. Show dim expert dimensions, let's just get rid of that tolerance. And now in that case, I've now isolated everything that you see here in this left side view. So I go to my right view, it's gonna slide around, show those dimensions, I go back to my left, and you're gonna see just those types of dimensions. I guess that one's still gonna be on for what I'm doing right now. But what I want you to see is these views along the bottom are effectively snapshots of settings. And that's really the key again to how this Dim Expert tool works and it uh, gathers things together. Um, with something like this, I would just recapture this view. I've got the dimensions on the screen, I've got the ones from my left, I'm just gonna capture what I see right here so I don't have to see anything else. But to depict this to you, I want to right click on this annotations folder and show you that just basically it has check marks for everything, okay? If I switch over to the right side view, different view, different capture, and now I right click on the annotations, show feature dimensions is off on that one. So when you capture a view, that view captures the settings, not only what is shown and what is hidden, but the ways that things are shown and hidden as far as ons and offs with dimensions and things. So those are some interesting features as to how things get isolated and how they don't, and separating those out. Now, one of the problems that I have on this one is that there's a second level of dimensions that I want to deal with. Well, I told you, flat patterns and sheet metal, sketches, section views, all that stuff works here because you do section views on drawings. You have to be able to do them here. So we do them just the way that we would um, with any normal circumstance. Here, I just go use my section tool. Let's move that over to a front view. And what I want to do is just kind of hack off that front lip there, and that's pretty good. So now we get rid of that piece of geometry. Now I'm going to orient this thing back into the left view here because I want to just see it in that position. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's turn our section view back on. All right. So now we're going to go back over into this position. And now what I've essentially got here is the dimensions for the front feature turned off. Now I'm gonna put some dimensions on these back features here for just a second, and that's essentially gonna be another view here. It's gonna be this, this left view number two, if you will. Um, but I'm gonna call it a section view because you could rename these as you go. So these dimensions, I got a little blow up here on my video driver. If I just hit rebuild, it goes away. Okay, so all these tolerances have been coming from this mystical place. Well, the mystical place is tools and options. So this is a document property. It's just like any other property. It would live in your templates. So under Tools and Options, you're going to go over into that Document property. So File, New, start from the same file, it'll have all the same properties. We're getting into this tab here called Dim Expert. And like I said, this has been in the software for a decade or so, um, but more or less unused, kind of future looking. When you expand this out, you're going to see settings for size dimensions. Zoom in again. So all you're doing is essentially predetermining the default plus or minus and orientation and syntax of each of these. So this is a symmetric dimension, um, plus or minus one millimeter, symmetric plus or minus two. And that's the difference between a diameter, a slot with a width or a length, a core, uh, I'm sorry, a counterbore, countersink, and so on. If you use location dimensions, the distance is an automatic symmetric with 0.2 and the angle is the same with a one degree. So there are these baseline or these default values that you use pretty much everywhere. And then from that point, you change the ones that differ from that. So 
that's something that you got to play with to, to really feel, to, to get comfortable with. Um, but a lot of times I equate what I see here to those types of settings that you see in the title block of a drawing where it says this dimension has a particular plus or minus tolerance, significant digits can affect those types of things as well. <clears throat> so one of the things down here in geometric tolerances, this is the minutiae you'll want to look at even on your own SOLIDWORKS standard seat because it'll all be there as well, is when we're dealing with material, uh, maximum material conditions, um, position tolerances, there's different values for those versus the composite surface. And then again, the different applications that we would use for maximum material condition being used for a datum feature. What I'm going to do is add a dimension and then a geometric tolerance frame. And by turning on this thing here called create basic dimensions, any holes that I'm doing these operations on are going to automatically get these additional dimensions. So I'm going to turn that on here for just a second. And we're going to say okay to that. Sorry guys, I'm on dry mouth here. So our section view is activated. Now with this, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. And in this case, we're just going to use a size dimension. Now size dimension on a hole is a pretty easy thing. And when you click it, you might be able to see right up there it says 2x because it found this hole and this hole with a single click. They're not the same feature. They're just the same size on the same face. It's just that smart for those types of things. But what happens when we go ahead and put this in place is I now want to add a geometric tolerance control frame to this. Now with it selected, the tolerance control frame attaches directly to it. So I'm just going to select that and fill out a regular GTOL box. Again, your skills might need a little brush up here. I think all of us could use that. Uh, but for this one here, I'm just going to use a basic positional tolerance. Uh, it's a little bit loose there, so I'm going to make that a point 0.1. And there's some manual interaction here. I'm just putting tolerances in uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, ABC. And then we're going to go ahead on this one and let's go ahead and use a maximum material condition. So that's going to effectively do the creating of those basic dimensions that I triggered with that check mark. So as soon as I add a geometric uh, control frame with a positional tolerance and say go, watch all these other holes. They all get all these dimensions added to them. So that hole and that hole, based on primary, secondary, and tertiary datums determined before, get all of these different dimensions added to them automatically. So this is now a section view of a second level hole, so you can see that back there, where I now get to see things that are front level, and then I can cut with the section view and get to things that are just behind there. But still, it's just like a 2D drawing when you do think about it. Now it's an interesting tool, we have this thing called, uh, uh, this 3D view here, which all the dimensions actually show. I think it looked like a real messy part in this case. But we have a nifty little patented feature here that allows us to automatically toggle the orientation of these. And when you turn this on, it's going to gray out the ones or fade out the ones that don't work until you reach the position of the ones that do work. So it's a really interesting tool for vetting the dimensions in 3D space that either do or don't work for a particular, particular position. You see them all fading and going away. What's that feature called? Well, it's called dynamic activation, or dynamic annotation view, excuse me. Uh, I put the button up here on my heads up toolbar, but I do not think it's there by default, right, because it is a model-based definition thing. All right. So, Yes. Um, the ones that I'm clicking the buttons up here for are not, but the ones that I brought forward from the feature dimensions were definitely feature dimensions. So there, there's two ways that I look at that. Anything that you add to a 3D part, and this has been forever, even just basic reference dimensions, they will react to geometric changes, but they don't control the geometry. Sketch and feature dimensions, when you double click them, you drive the geometry. So when I went back to this one here, this left view, these dimensions here are actually full feature dimensions. So double clicking those gives me an editable dimension. Um, so those obviously will control the geometry and update the views and react to it. Any of these other dimensions that I've added through these processes, these are all reference dimensions. All I can do is change properties of them, but not the actual values. But if the geometry shifts for any change, those will react to that physical geometry. So there isn't any, uh, any fear of having things go out of date in these cases as well. Um, what are we going to do on this? Uh, who uses configurations in here? Do you guys use configs? Okay, almost everybody in here. That's great, actually. Uh, configs are obviously a very powerful way to make similar but different derivatives of all your parts, whether it's manual or based on a spreadsheet and the sophistication that's there. This tool also works with configurations. Now, what happens is when I'm looking at this, and I'm just going to show you over here again on my DIM Expert tab, we've been scheming this part. 
as is this configuration. So all of this information here actually applies to my default configuration of the part. If I take this now and I change the configuration, well, I'm moving to a completely different piece of geometry, so it completely clears out the scheming. Um, however, with something like this, and let me hide those dimensions because they just simply don't need to be visible. When you're dealing with this, what you can do is this little button right here, it's called Copy Scheme. And that actually allows me to copy the way that I schemed the previous configuration of the part right onto the new part. So when I'm dealing with something like that, I don't have to redo the part from scratch. Um, one thing I wanted to do actually, is I'm gonna go back to the right view here for one second. Um, there's another dimension I wanted to show you real quick here too, because it's not all about automatic stuff. Automatic is fun demo wear, and it really is reality of the way it works. But most of you will go through and probably manually discreetly pick things. So when you're using things like, uh, let's see this particular orientation here, I wanna make sure right view is activated. Because when I use just basic things like size dimensions, I can pick on the face that's round here. And it actually knows that that's a fillet. So what it's showing me there is the radius of five plus or minus 0.25. If I roll it over to this side and I pick on this flat face, look at that. It's actually a chamfer dimension. It's got my distance, five plus or minus 0.5, and then times 45 degrees. So those types of dimensional tools are very effective for creating each of those types of dimensions. Just pick the face, place the text, and it's just like a 2D drawing. Again, same type of thing. When we get into the configurations though, that's where things can get quite interesting. So when I move over to this new configuration, I'm gonna steal the values from the previous setup that we just did. And in this particular case, the source configuration is the only other config that has any type of scheming data. But what will happen typically in a case like this is a bunch of the dimensions that don't apply to features in this configuration will show with that dangling color that you're all familiar with, used to, I don't know, know and love, I don't think you like it, but it's that color that says, yep, something's definitely wrong here. Now in our case, we're just deleting those because with this configuration, they're completely unnecessary. But it does show you pretty plainly where there are major differences in geometry from configuration to configuration. Now the radius on the inside stayed, um, but that fillet on the outside is no longer a chamfer, therefore that dimension had to go away. So in this case, I'm gonna capture this 3D view. It's a different configuration, but doesn't matter. We're capturing it as is. And it enables us to switch back and forth from one to the other fluidly. See both of those schemes. Is this blowing everybody's mind or are you liking what you're seeing? Okay, and trust me, this is gonna be a really long process for everybody to get on board, which will probably never happen. Uh, but there is this transitional period where you'll be able to play with this and, and kind of deal with what you have on screen. So the deliverables are a lot of times what we're talking about. This is just an exercise in creating data if I can't share it with anybody. So up here at the top, what you're seeing are a couple of different things. There's publish to e-drawings. If that's your tried and true viewer, um, you're gonna love it with what we do here in 2019. It's just ridiculously awesome. So if you've enjoyed e-drawings up to this point or even tolerated it, you need to look at it again because e-drawings is incredible these days. Uh, with Salvers 2018, by the way, we started using the video drivers and the actual video card with e-drawings. I don't know if you felt it was sluggish before, but it's really good now. Yeah? Do you have to publish to e-drawings? Mm -mm. PDF is the other way. And that's probably gonna be the most likely. Like shot that's using e-drawing. Mm-hmm. Or he has e-drawings that can't just open the, the part file. Correct. It has to be out of e okay, so here's two ways. I'm gonna show you both actually, because they're both important. I'm gonna hit publish e-drawing. Now one thing that we did with Salvers 2018 is e-drawings publishing enabled you to do this first of all, is you can choose what configurations to publish. So, okay, great. But with model-based definition turned on, what I can also do is embed a step file for any configurations I choose also. And that's that AP242 step file. Now AP242, to repeat this one more time, because it's important, is the step file with the PMI built into it. That is a 3D body without features and sketches, but has all of these annotations attached to it. And they're called semantic annotations, which means they're graphically attached. When you click them, they highlight the geometry. So from a discoverability standpoint, um, I don't think anybody in here has ever made a mistake on a 2D drawing, but when the machinist finds a mistake on a 2D drawing, they love nothing more than to march up in the front office and show you that, hey, Mr. Engineer, exactly. See, I know you've never seen this before, but I ran into it once. Oh man, they really like to stick it to you. Well, you know, in this particular case, it's very discoverable. Dimensions with, with extensions that go to seemingly similar edges, um, especially when there's tiny chamfers and fillets in there, it strobes like this for a minute or so while it's creating each of these. Um, it's making individual views of each of these. 
So once it's done with all this, it gives you that geometry, but the highlight is really the great part about the interactivity here. And I've totally got more data than I've got time to show you. But here is the e-drawing, first of all. It's gonna give you this data with PMI, 3D views shows at the bottom. So when you go ahead and click on any of these, you're seeing those on the e-drawing. When you click them, let me highlight to the side. You see that? So it actually clicks and highlights the holes. So not in that particular case. Let's get to a different one, right over here. So we got our feature and sketch dimensions on that one. Remember I put this 3D view in by picking on these faces? Anybody that picks on these dimensions is seeing exactly what faces those dimensions go between. It's really an incredible thing for that purpose. Now the addition to this one with eDrawings 2018 is if you look right down here, there's this button called Attachments. And when you click on that, that is the two step files that I embedded into this. Now I can click either one of those and I can either go ahead and look at it or I can download it and extract it. And a step file would be then machinable. So when I say view, it just simply opens up in another tab and just kind of go with it here. It is that step file. It's got all the data built on there, so it's now geometryless, but it still has that semantic attachment to it when it comes to those clicks. Now, that's the e-drawing. If your tool of choice is PDF, well, PDF gives you a customizable template in order to put this in play. And if I've got some time, I'm gonna show you that in the end, but I wanna create views on my PDF of every view that I've captured and then down here at the bottom, it gives us that other magical step that says also create and attach an AP242 file. Now I can attach any other files I want too, JPEGs, emails, Word documents. A PDF file, believe it or not, can be a container for dozens of embedded documents. And I had no idea about that until about three years ago. But when you attach files manually or the step file, it automatically embeds each of those into the final output. So I'm gonna throw this out here. We're gonna call this one um, user group and then say save. So now this is gonna strobe through each of these again. I got about nine minutes to get through the rest of this. And you'll see each of these views get created. But the deliverable being that universal thing that everybody's more familiar with. So I'm sure everybody's computer, either by default or at some point initially got Adobe Acrobat viewer, DC viewer, I think is the latest. That's all it takes. So these things are great. Uh, I'd say the PDF is less demanding. Eh, I, I, yeah, yep. The e-drawing as of 2018 is less demanding than it was. Um, so I mentioned again, e-drawings, uh, e, yeah, that's a good word. E-drawings 2018, they actually started using the, the graphics, the, the OpenGL video drivers. Before we didn't, so you'd open a file in SOLIDWORKS and it would rotate smooth, and in e-drawings it would be clunky and sluggish. Um, 2018, not quite the same thing. It's way, way better. But you'll see some of the lists of the viewer stuff there as we go. So here's a PDF file. Uh, universal again. Now PDFs are interesting because in the template editor, you can put fields in a PDF where a user can input things and then save the PDF, even if they just have a PDF viewer. So it's electronic signature or it's a communication type of cell. But down here at the bottom is all of my thumbnails. So I can click on each of those as necessary. And then if you rotate this around and start zooming in and picking on stuff, and I've got a video issue here, so a lot of times my highlighting isn't working in my PDF viewer where it does everywhere else, but that's typical. So in this case, I've got an issue going on just with the, uh, the driver I've got used. Now this one has two pages. So I'm gonna go to my second page here for a second. Uh, I just did the part here, so this one isn't gonna have all the other views that I wanna do on this one. So I'm gonna do one more quick kick out, and that's gonna be going back into this assembly for a second because I want to do a really quick PDF of the assembly document as well. And one of the things I'd like you to see here is that there is some dimensions um, that we have up in this particular part. And if you didn't know this, from the beginning of SOLIDWORKS, you could always add dimensions to a 3D solid that you've created. They just appear as reference dimensions. When you're in SOLIDWORKS, if you go to annotations or sketch and you just hit smart dimension, um, it just simply comes up and asks you, do you want this to be a dim expert, location, size, basic, or just a basic reference dimension, which you can go ahead and still select these days. But that would enable me to come in here and say, okay, now I wanna, I'm zooming the wrong thing. Now I wanna go ahead and put a dimension between the front of this knob and uh, you know, maybe where the center of this hole happens to be. And that's just a basic reference dimension that you get from the software. Go ahead and take a right side view and that gives you that type of a dimension. But what you can also do is exploded views. So if I take my explode configuration here, let's actually just go ahead and create a new view. And that new view is gonna be called explode, EXP, no dimensions, but I'm gonna do it based on an already created configuration called explode. So I already had an exploded configuration in there, so that just helps. 
and even display states are supported. So I've got one that I've got this part transparent so you can see it better. Um, okay, so that created my exploded view. So now that we've got all of these created, let me kick this off really fast again as a PDF file. I want to use one that's a little bit more appropriate for assemblies, which these are all, except for four that are on here, come with your installation. So you could use these. Um, I'm going to do a landscape for assemblies. Okay, good enough. And then you can also put properties in as necessary. So the reason I wanted to show you this is when you kick an assembly out to a PDF, there's an interactivity element with a bill of materials that's really great as well. So not only do you get the dimensions, which when you pick them, they're gonna highlight those different orientations, but this exploded view with the bill of materials allows for that bi-directional clicking on a part, highlights on the bill of materials. Click on the bill, it highlights back on the part. I forgot how many times this one screen captures before it goes, it's just about done. With Dave on the panel, I'd be surprised if they stopped on time in there. And I've worked for him for 21 years too, so I can say that. All right, so we're gonna trust this document. Again, now we have this document that has an assembly. So I'm rotating it around, I'm zooming, I'm panning as necessary. There are tools built all through, um, all through the uh, Acrobat Reader for you to do these types of different types of wireframe displays and shadeds and the measurement stuff is built in there somewhere. But what I wanted to show you is this right here. So here's the bill of materials. You click on a part, it highlights over on the bill on the right hand side. Click on the part over on the right hand side, it highlights in the graphics area. And that is all just a result of it being an assembly kicked out to a template that had a bill of materials window in it. Simple as that. Usually I have page two, um, always has that bill of materials window in it. Mm -hmm. No, no, th those are just ones that I had customized to put my own stuff into. Yeah, when you're, when you're wanting to format these the way that you want them, you have this thing called the template editor. And what that'll do is that will open up any PDF um, template that we already have, so all the ones that I've shipped to you, and you can put your own properties in there the way that you want them, put your own logos all over the place. It really is just a matter of putting in the same properties that you do in a 2D drawing, actually, again, to keep it consistent. Oh my God, what happened up there? How long have you not been looking at that? There we go. It was, uh, yeah, it was when it switched over on that last one. So this is the template editor. It's a button right up here you click, and then it opens up those templates. So we can add the properties at the top here. This is where a graphics window would be. Down here are where thumbnails would be. And then I can do things like putting in images, background images. Um, where's the one I'm looking for? There is a uh, note box. Why can't I find my note box? There you go. So there's a placeholder for PDF notes and things, um, people to be able to insert. And then uh, even any of these notes, you can go ahead and put properties to any of those as well. So those will auto-populate. But you can set that up to look the way you want and again, put your logos on there and the look and feel is gonna be consistent with something that maybe people are already used to receiving from you. Um, I blew through basically every other slide that I had. So there was the template editor there. Again, change the layouts, make it look the way you want to, put input fields there for people to be able to talk, change it, save it, and pass it along if necessary. But the attachments of the AP242 file is what the DOD's ultimate goal was. We had a time as a reseller where if you wanted to sell to a military house, you better be walking in with Pro-E. You better have that or you don't even talk to them. And they realized quickly that for budgetary sake, not every company had either skilled enough users to use Pro-E or had the money for it because it's an expensive and difficult tool to use. Very capable, but those are the two hits that we always have on it. So they said, okay, forget all that. Final deliverable is the PDF or the step file. Anybody can make it, it's the same deliverable to everybody, and it doesn't matter what your feature history is, it still is something that can be machined. So that's why that attachment point is the, uh, the real selling part of what this is for communication purposes. So I think my slides are gonna conclude right about the right time here. So I hope you got a little bit out of that. Now the last thing I wanted to hit, I said dabble in this. You might be doing traditional drawings for a long, long, long time. Well, let's go back into this part for one second. When I take this part, which I've made all these 3D views in, and I do the same operation of saying file, make drawing from part or assembly, you get all of these views on the right hand side in your view palette. But you'll notice that some of these views say 3D view. Those are all of the model based definition views. And if you simply come up here to the top, and this is what makes it work, is if you come up here to the top and say import annotations from your DIM expert annotations as well as these 3D view annotations, then when I drag my front 3D view in, what I get are all of the annotations from the front 3D views. So these are now annotations from each of those views. See the G tiles and everything that's on there? 
So you can use it to make PMI-based, model-based definition files if that's your deliverable, or you can play with it for now to get skilled and then use those as the values that you put on your 2D drawings. So deliver what you've been delivering, but skill up and be ahead of the game if possible. So very important with each of those. All right, yeah, I'm glad I saw that. That was a, a little bit of a kicker at the end that's pretty important. So the last couple of things I mentioned, Cam reads these, B, these PMIs. We do those, we read them, and we create tolerance-based machining tool paths. And then inspection actually uses these same types of 3D elements, where up to this point it was always just ballooned 2D drawings or PDF files. But now it will balloon each of those and create the same bill of characteristics that we use for inspection. So it used to be inspection did its thing and BD did its thing and then we talked to other people using PDFs and e-drawings for other things and now it's this one big circle of everything. So I spent some time on this last slide here talking about, oh, we even read PMI from Pro-E and other products and inspect it um, with our inspection tool. So we went from this typical process that I was talking to you before is the 3D part to the 3D assembly back to the old faithful and then hopefully getting good accurate data. And what I'm hoping that we're doing now is using model-based definition is we can start with an MBD-rich part, jump into an MBD-rich assembly, which we can do those there as well. And then from there, tolerance-based automated machining and then automatic inspections. And then maybe if you need those. So well, I've got quiet right when I'm done talking. You like that? All right. So if you need the drawings, that's still an availability, but you'll still not lose anything by doing some of this model-based definition stuff up front. So thank you very much for hanging out with me for an hour. I'll stay and ask questions uh, wherever you need. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ordinate dimension? Um, I believe the answer is, oh man. I'm gonna say yes, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna try it. Because ordinate dimensioning, would be feature or sketch dimensions that I could bring across. So that's a definite in that respect. Um, but putting them on with location and dimensions like this is something I wouldn't be able to do. So I would probably have to orient ordinate dimension in the feature itself um, or come in here and do a reference dimension, but then I can't set that to ordinate. Yeah, I can't do it there. So yeah, that would have to be a sketch that I then bring forward, I believe. Uh, yeah, I never create everything No. Sometimes I'll make a pattern of holes that I'll order it, but other than that, that's about it. Yeah, um, I thought I had a stack of them out here, but I put them in my pocket. Yes, there you go. Great, thanks. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, I named them, or I should have named them, but I didn't really do a great job at that, did I? Yeah, and it's, I should do that. Yeah, that would be a better way to do that. For anybody that didn't know how I was zooming in and out, Windows button, the little window, Plus, and what that does is it brings up this thing called the magnifier, which you can magnify in and out if you want. But when you're in the magnifier, if you hold down Control and Alt, zooming becomes a scroll in and out. And that's the entire Windows interface there. So when I have four monitors, all four of them blow up and get smaller. So it's a pretty interesting thing. So anyways, thank you very much.